Um, my name again is Cindy Milstein, and I will try to talk for less than a half hour, but it might end up being that. So Andre and I have um, titled this together, The Anarchist Moment, and he it does history, and um, I tend to think politically, so I'm going to try to focus it on that and see if I succeed. Um, first, I want to briefly, well, there's been a lot of discussion this weekend around what is anarchism, and I just briefly wanted to touch on that without trying, because there's a lot of anarchists in the room, um, fortunately today, who I'm friends with, and they will have far different views of it than I, or similar but different, and I actually love that, that's what I love about anarchism. So I'm going to start with um, um, John Holloway's book, Crack Capitalism. Um, I, I'm really in, enjoying this work in the sense that I feel like it's sort of a pu work of pu being a public intellectual. Um, and the title is meant to be both the fissures in capitalism and the fissures in the logic of it. How do we find cracks in something in order to destroy it? Um, and the two categories which I think he gets at, which to me exemplify anarchism. Um, one, he talks about um, the concept of self-determination as a social concept, not individual. And he counterposes that to a world that's predetermined. So I understand anarchism as this impulse to try to get at the logic of a world that tries to determine things for us. And we're trying, it's that moment when we start cracking the logic on which we start to determine the world ourselves. Um, the second point he, the second um, thing he points out is that that needs to be combined with the politics of dignity, which he takes from a bunch of actually existing movements right now. And he contrasts that to a world in which we're turned into objects. And the politics of dignity turns us back into subjects where we look at each other as human beings and speak to each other as differentiated, not necessarily you know, full human, that we see each other as fully human beings for the sake of who we are and we treat each other politically in that way. And I like those two things. And he, to some degree, then tends to focus on the politics of doing. Um, he's interested in the category of capitalism. Um, and contrasting that to um, a world that is produced for us that we need to be doing it ourselves. Um, I would add to this that I think the project of anarchism and what makes it really unique is that it's trying to crack hierarchy and domination, which is much more broad than capitalism. Much as John Holloway's work, it's one of the most cogent four pages of, um, he really looks at why the state is a problem. It's a really lovely three or four pages. Um, but anarchism is trying to also look at other categories. Um, so to the logic of a world that's trying to be a quantitative or a world of exchange, anarchists um, contrast that with a world that's qualitative, a world in which we come up with an ethical understanding of how we treat each other. Um, and that can be seen in, in a lot of sort of anarchistic ethics of um, commons, sharing, borrowing, gifting, mutual aid, cooperation. Um, the second really big category, and that's what I want to focus on today, is a political, what I understand to be related to the conference, which is political philosophy, um, is this impulse to contrast a world of non-participation um, with a world of complete participation. In the category that anarchists often use is self-organization very broadly, and Andre tried to outline some of the beauty of all that. I really want to focus in on the category of self-governance um, in a way in which we understand how we both govern ourselves, but we also govern society. And so I want to contrast that to John Holloway's and add to his we are striving for a world of doing with a world of also deciding. Um, and that those two things are crucial. And I understand deciding the adopt dialogical process, and I, this format makes for an undialogical process today, and I actually want to challenge us to be dialogic, because that is part of the politics of how we begin to decide the world for ourselves, including in spaces like this. Um, much as I want to thank the organizers for creating the space. So how I would understand anarchism then, and what makes it really unique in its contribution, is it's a thoroughgoing or holistic or rigorous refusal, critique, antagonism, rage, suspicion, we can go on and on, of hierarchy and domination in all its forms, all its forms, from the most minute everyday micro-politics of everyday life, exploitation, oppression, alienation, power over others, institutions, systems. Um, I, I really want to emphasize this. Anarchists basically are suspicious of all forms of hierarchy and domination, which doesn't mean we see them all, all the time. Um, but that is also combined with anarchism being a thoroughgoing and holistic understanding of experiments in actually trying to come up with a non-hierarchical world. So anarchists spend a lot of time doing experimentation, theorizing, prefiguring, queering, embracing, joyfully envisioning um, how to understand what that would look like. And so in brief, I understand anarchism to be um, a political philosophy of and the working existence of freedom. Um, the, the key categories anarchists are contrasting to, which relates to this conference in terms of political philosophy. 
Um, Murray Bookshin's work, who I'm um, really indebted to and was really striking to sit here. There's some other folks in the room who have come through that tradition that his name has not actually been mentioned here because a lot of the papers that were read, it's almost like if they had actually read his work, might have completely understood that those things came from him or he actually worked through them. Maybe not well, but, <clears throat> but in some certain cases. But there was a tradition and a trajectory that he was part of that was using ideas that came from Rent or Costa Real and other people. Um, so I really like Murray talking about anarchism um, as us grappling with the intertwining legacy and practice of, of constantly battling the, the legacy of freedom and domination, how they intertwine, shape each other, push each other, challenge each other, and how within each moment we find the other constantly. So it's a messy contradictory. Politics is messy contradictory. As a friend of mine recently said, politics is this idea of holding contradictions and coming up with how we can decide the world we continually want based on those contradictions. Okay, now I want to get to political philosophy. Um, and I just want to, anarchists also are refuse, refuse to be disciplined, and I'm kind of using that playfully because here we are in a place that is trying to create disciplines. And I actually want to undiscipline political philosophy um, and make it our own way of self-disciplining how we think about the world. And to me, the, uh, my understanding of political philosophy, um, I'm really done a Todd May did, did a little class one time in an anarchist summer school I'm involved, used to be involved in where he talked about political philosophy being when we look at the world and look at power relationships and try to figure out what our relationship to that is and how we deal with the question of power. And so I really want to look at political philosophy as the pursuit of wisdom and insight via speculation, analysis, and theory in order to understand the reality of what's happening in the world, specifically around power relationships. And that's something that I want to make collective, common, participatory, and shared, and I um, think that's something that everybody can do in the world. Um, you don't have to, we are all hopefully political philosophers. And I really want to focus today on the concept um, of government and governance. Okay, so I only have about 20 minutes, and I just want to talk of, of or 25 minutes maybe left. I want to kind of just focus in on anarchism and what I think this, this specific moment anarchism has contributed to a, a, an upending in a good way of how we think about government and governance. Not fully, but to some degree in a, in a really incredible way where we've made a mess of it in a good way. Um, John Holloway, I really love his book, he talks about um, us as being misfits, as the people that are crazy enough to think we can't fit in this world, and that's actually the project is not to fit. It's to, to realize how you don't fit and push, push against it. So I really like that idea of doing this. Um, so the reason I think this is an anarchist moment, um, I want to start out in relation to politics and government, is that anarchism has often been seen as this like anti-statism um, as being one of its key categories against the state, which it is. Although, again, I really want to come back to anarchism being a thoroughgoing critique of hierarchy, but for now, I'll focus on its key insight, is questioning the concepts of statecraft or governance over. Um, and this is, I think, a key moment for anarchism right now, and that anarchism has been able to actually begin to chip away at the understanding of the state, as Andre had said, as being sort of state-centric, or us being the, the people that are the de-statizing de the present. Um, um, I have, there's a quote I really love from Hannah Rents oh, for years, which Murray Bookshin actually pointed out to me, um, which in her book on revolution, she talks about the lost treasure of revolutions, which is the councilist tradition. Um, but she actually has a lovely little quote that um, is below that, which are within a, a subset of that, where she talks about um, this lost treasure being, quote, the organizational impulse of people themselves. The organizational impulse of people themselves. How we choose to self-govern. Um, and she talks about that as being lost, and I've always thought that was sort of a beautiful thing. But I actually want to problematize that right now in a sense, and I think I've been wrong in thinking it was lost. As Andre had pointed out, anarchists have always actually seen that these, this has happened everywhere throughout human history. That it hasn't been lost, but it's been hidden or subterranean, or maybe not the dominant way of understanding the world. But that people have always figured out how to organize themselves in various ways, how to self-govern. And maybe that has not been the dominant form. Um, Bookshin also points out this sort of same thing in a book, a series of books called The Third Revolution. Other people have done this too, where in moments where there's a vacuum of top-down power, um, where kings fall, where presidents fall, where there's a economies fall, that people turn to each other and start to figure out how to govern. And to, to some degree, they know how to do that. And anarchists have this profound belief that when people are in a space where they have the world in front of them, they will figure out ways very inventive and creative ways to figure out directly how to govern themselves. Um, uh, 
Now, the way I understand this lost treasure, which I actually hope is not actually a lost treasure, is how we've understood all sorts of ways of organizing through communes, militias, assemblies, consultas, collectives, confederations, direct democracies, assemblies, Soviets before they were ruined, all sorts of ways where people have very inventively figured out ways to self-govern. So I just want to kind of now problematize like why I think anarchism has really contributed to decentering a sense of the state as being the only way we think about governance and government. First, I think this is actually our moment as anarchists. Um, and what, what I mean by that both is the description for this conference that talked about, you know, anarchism was an insult, but now there's a space cleared away by, you know, actual conditions that makes anarchism relevant and potentially desirable. And to some degree, that is true. There's spaces created by how capitalism is structured now, et cetera, et cetera. Spaces outside of us as anarchists. But I actually think anarchists have had a role in making space right now for a, a way of looking, decentralizing the role of the state. Um, I feel like we are one part of a global zeitgeist, of, as um, Raul Zabechi um, titled a translation of his book he just put out called Dispersing Power. Um, it's been called variously autonomous movements, horizontalism, anti-authoritarianism, anti a whole host of names, but that we are part of that, and we are an active part of that, and we have been part of shaping that. Uh, the Midnight Notes Collective um, wrote a piece called Promissory Notes, and in it they talk about different movements around the globe that have participated in creating this moment over the past 20 years of actually creating a space for non-status forms of organization. And um, they really point to anarchist roles, specifically in Europe and North America, as part of like the large-scale mass mobilizations against things like the WTO and the World Bank um, and other uh, similar institutions. And that they also link that to movements that are not anarchists but are in in sympathy with ways of understanding the world through not states. And So I wanted, in North America, there's too many examples to use of how anarchists have both contributed to the movements here, the practices, and the theory of decentering the state, but I just wanted to point to a few of them, um, or a couple, because I don't have much time. We could actually maybe come back to that if people are anarchists in the room, it would be really interesting. I really wanted to focus on how anarchists have challenged the notion of how we make decisions in the process of actually changing the world. And so in a, a lot of what anarchists have brought into this global sort of zeitgeist of dispersing power here in North America has not necessarily been the grand experiments that we've seen in the rest of the world where people have created autonomous communities um, or regions. Um, but so far, anarchists have contributed to creating spaces of decentering how we understand anti-capitalist work. So that the process of being an anti-capitalist involves highly directly democratic, participatory, consensus-seeking ways of coming to deciding how we will do what we do in hopes of hopefully pushing that further to social power in the longer term, I would hope here, in terms of other. Um, so to some degree, how they've done that is through models of um, affinity groups, both council structures, where people have come together in small decision-making groups um, and federated together to make larger decisions. Um, so it's neither a local nor um, top-down, but in a sense, you're trying to constantly disperse or push power down. Um, so that now, in a sense, have displaced Whenever people trying to organize things, the default position is increasingly has to become in the North American space ways of us highly participatory, where everybody has to decide together to move forward. That doesn't always happen, <laughs> but um, that has become more the default position, where before anarchists it was not the, the position. And I think anarchists have had a large that has been a role here is decentering how we even think about doing the work we do with open movements. 